Hi, and welcome to module two of the Introduction to Dask tutorial. In this module, we'll cover processing tabular data with Dask data frames. You will learn when to use Dask data frames. We will look at the Dask data frame syntax. We'll learn how to perform computations with Dask data frames, how to work with partitions, and some performance tips. I'll be working from a Jupyter notebook that you can access at this link. All right, so I've opened up the Jupyter Notebook for Module 2 Dask Data Frames. Let's jump in. As we saw in the opening video of the tutorial, Pandas is great for tabular datasets that fit into memory. But if you're working with datasets that are larger than your machine can handle, Dask becomes useful, because Dask can cut up your big dataset into smaller bits and execute those smaller parts in parallel. So whereas Pandas might run into a memory error, Dask can handle those types of large-scale computations comfortably. This also means that you shouldn't use Dask if you don't need to. Parallel computing comes with extra complexity and might incur overhead uh, that may be larger than the performance gain you will get by using Dask. So if your datasets fit into memory and your computations are running fast enough, don't use Dask. This notebook uses a dataset containing New York City flight data. Uh, this data is only about 200 megabytes on disk uh, so that you can download it easily and so that exercises finish quickly enough for this live video tutorial. But in real case scenarios, you would use Dask data frame for much larger data sets. So let's get started. We will uh, run the prep data Python script that's located in the repository to download the data and then create a path to our multiple CSV files. We can then import Dask data frame as DD and use that to read our files into a Dask data frame. And you'll notice here that some things are familiar for Pandas users and some things might be a little different. So we're using the exact same read CSV method and passing it arguments that will be similar to what you would do in Pandas. However, when we call the data frame, we don't get the result that we would expect if we're working in Pandas. A Pandas data frame would show us some of the contents of the data frame, but Dask only shows us some schematic information about the data set. We have the column names, the data types, and the number of partitions. This is because Dask is lazy, and that might sound strange, but we'll get into that a little bit more uh, later in this module but it's important to keep that in mind. So all that Dask has done at this point is read the beginning of the file to get the column names, which we can access with the column attrib columns attribute, and the data types, which we can access with the data types attribute. Dask data frames also have an n partitions attribute to show us how many parts the data frame has been cut up into. Dask data frame was designed to look and feel a lot like Pandas. This means it implements a well-used portion of the Pandas API, but in a way that allows for parallel and out-of-core computations. So this means that a lot of Dask data frame code will look and feel pretty familiar to Pandas users. You can see that in this section here. We've got a familiar read CSV section, and a group by computation looks identical to Pandas, except for the compute call at the end. And we'll talk about why that's necessary in a little bit. So how is Dask data frame able to stick so closely to the pandas syntax? Well, this is because under the hood, a Dask data frame is actually composed of many pandas data frames. So if you remember from the introduction video, we talked about how parallel computing splits a large bit of work into smaller parts. And in the case of Dask, each small part is a pandas data frame that can be processed on a single core. And multiple of these computations can happen in parallel. And now because each partition is a pandas data frame, Dask is actually just performing a bunch of regular pandas operations on regular pandas objects under the hood, and then bringing those uh, results back together into an aggregated result. So let's take a look at some code to see this in action. Let's say that we wanted to compute the largest flight departure delay in our dataset. And our dataset contains multiple files. We could do this with pandas by creating a for loop that iterates over each individual CSV file, 
extracts the maximum from each file and then gets the maximum of all of those individual maximums. That would look something like this. There's an easier way to do this with Dask data frames. And it's not only easier, but it also executes in parallel, right? This pandas code can do what we want it to do, but the for loop is sequential. Each iteration of the for loop happens after the previous. Dask data frame allows you to compute this result in parallel with syntax that's identical to pandas. So we will select the departure delay column and call the max method on it. And we'll store that in the variable max delay. If we call this variable, we get an unexpected result if we're used to pandas. Pandas would give us the immediate result here. This is called eager evaluation. When you ask for something, pandas immediately gives it to you. Dask, however, only um, creates the task graph, the root, the recipe, to get to the final result, but doesn't actually execute it. Remember, I said it was lazy. And it's precisely this lazy evaluation that allows Dask to optimize computations for parallel processing. No computation happens unless you specifically tell Dask to do so by calling compute. This allows Dask to build the task graph, which is basically like a recipe or a root map that contains all the necessary instructions to arrive at the final result, but doesn't actually get the result yet. Only when we call compute, Dask will take all of those in instructions and execute on them. And because Dask first builds a task graph, it can then spot opportunities for short shortcuts and optimizations, leading to faster processing. Let's make this visual and take a look at the task graph for the max delay result. This may seem a little intimidating at first, but I'm going to walk you through it. Task graphs are re read from bottom to top. So we'll start at the bottom here with 10 individual calls to read CSV. This is a CSV file that's being read and loaded into a Dask data frame partition. From each partition, we are getting the departure delay column and then calculating the max over that column. And then we are aggregating all of the 10 individual maximums into a single result, max delay. Again, no computation has actually happened here. Dask has only created the task graph that says, when you want this result, I will know how to get it. When we call compute, Dask will execute on the task graph and give us the final result. Let's look at some more computations with Dask data frames. Let's say we wanted to calculate the total of non-canceled flights taken. There's a column in our data frame called canceled, which is a Boolean. We can negate that to get the non-canceled flights and sum the total number of rows. Again, we have to call compute here for this to actually execute. Let's look at another example. Let's say we wanted to take this total of non-canceled flights, but group it by the origin airport. That would look something like this, where we negate the column and we group by the origin and then count the number of rows. Now it's your turn. There's two exercises in this section. The first exercise is to calculate the average departure delay from each airport. Take a few minutes to think through it, and you can always uncomment and run the cell below to see the solution. Let's take a look at the solution. In order to get the average departure delay from each airport, we will group by the origin airport and then calculate the mean over the departure column and call compute to execute the computation. Time for another exercise. Can you find out what day of the week has the worst average departure delay? Take a few minutes again to think about this and you can always uncomment and run the cell below to see the solution. Let's take a look at the solution. We wanted to know what day of the week has the worst average departure delay. We can group by the day of the week and then get the average departure delay and then find the highest value of that result. And then again, call compute to actually execute the computation. The result is five 
which indicates the fifth day of the week being Friday. Let's now dive a little bit deeper into working with partitions. As we saw, Dask DataFrame is able to implement a large part of the Pandas API because Dask DataFrames are cut up into small bits, which are partitions, and each partition is actually just the Pandas DataFrame, which means we can perform Pandas operations on these partitions. Sometimes you might want to manipulate your Dask DataFrame with a custom function, something that's not a Pandas or Dask method. You can use the map partitions method for this. Imagine you find out that there was a two-minute error in the departure delay column, and you wanted to correct this. You could create a pandas apply function that will subtract two from every input, and you would input all the rows in the departure delay column in this case. We can then map this function over all of our partitions by passing it to map partitions. We see that we have a departure delay column and an adjusted departure delay column with now the correct values. Finally, I'd like to end by giving you a performance tip on when to call compute. We saw early, earlier that Dask builds task graphs that contain the instructions to perform your parallel computations. These task graphs can sometimes contain opportunities for optimizations or shortcuts if you want. Let's look at a specific example. Let's say we wanted to compute the mean and the standard deviation for the departure delay of all the non-canceled flights. We could do that by first creating an object that contains all of the non-canceled flights, and then calculating the mean and the standard devi deviation of that data separately. Nothing happens here uh, because we haven't called compute, right? Only the task graph has been built, but we can get these results by calling compute on both the mean delay and the standard delay. This will take about four seconds to run. Now let's see how long it takes if we combine these computations into a single task graph by using a single compute call. We'll use dask.compute for this and pass it mean delay and standard delay. You'll see that this runs in about half the time. This is because the task graphs for these results have been merged, which means that Dask only needs to read the data from the CSV file once instead of twice. Dask has optimized the shared operations for your results. Now, if we wanted to visualize this, we could get the task graph, which starts to look a lot more complicated, but we can see that there's arrows moving across the board left and right which means that results of tasks are being shared. This is how Dask is really able to optimize your parallel computations. All right, that concludes this module on working with tabular data with Dask data frames. What did we cover? We looked at when to use Dask data frames and when to stick with using pandas. We took a close look at the Dask data frame syntax and saw how it looks and feels a lot like pandas but gives you the opportunity to unlock the power of parallel computing. We performed a bunch of computations with Dask data frames, and you got your hands on writing some Dask data frame code. We talked a little bit more in depth about working with partitions and how you can map custom functions over your Dask data frames. And we ended by looking at some performance tips on when and how to call compute. So what's next? You've now completed the first two modules of the Introduction to Dask tutorial. The next module will cover processing array data with Dask arrays. I'll see you there.